Hello, everyone. Welcome back from our spring break. It is APH's Virtual Excel Academy. We are so happy to have you with us. Feel free to say hi in the chat. We see some of our friends joining us already. Welcome, welcome. Glad to have you back. Today is First Aid. You can do this. Again, Welcome to the APH Virtual Excel Academy. We are glad to have you with us today. Today is first aid, you can do this. We've had one first aid section. We're gonna push you a little further, see what you remember, and then learn some new things. Hi, Donnie, how are you? One more time for those of us that are just getting in the room. This is an APH Virtual Excel Academy. This session's meant for our younger elementary school students, but everybody is welcome. Today is first aid, you can do this. And we have a special guest. We have a nurse with us today, Melissa Hodgen. Hi, Melissa, how are you? Hi, I'm great, how are you? I am doing good. I am gonna turn this bunch of students over to you. Thank you, thank you. And thanks for coming back if you came last time. Um, I think we had a good time and I think we're going to learn some more today. Um, again, we are doing first aid and you can do this. Um, my name again is Melissa and I am a nurse. I am wearing a red scrub top and I am coming to you from Tennessee. It is warm outside. So thank you for coming and joining me on this beautiful day. So our goals for today are object one, um, to know why it is important to give first aid, and object two, to know what to do in an emergency. Oh, hi, Donnie, thank you. Um, okay, so what is first aid? For those of you who weren't here last time, let's break it down to the definition, really. First, let's see who, don't you always wanna be first in line? So that means you want to be there before anyone else. You wanna be the earliest person there. And aid means to help or support. So you are going to be one of the first ones to help. And we are gonna talk about some emergencies and situations where you can be the first one there to help. So why should we even take the time to learn this? Um, and then when we do learn it, why should we act when we have the chance? Here's the thing. You spend so much of your time learning and knowledge is power. You know, you have learned on your own to um, read braille or um, such and that allows you to have access to books now, and then you can take that knowledge and apply it. So it gives you the independence to do things without waiting for other people, which is so great. The other thing is our bodies are amazing. We have these senses that give us information. For instance, you can smell if there's a fire you know that smoke smell. You can feel, you can feel if someone is bleeding, you can feel that stickiness that um, is blood. Um, you can hear, you can hear if someone is breathing and how their breathing is, you know, and if you can see, then you can see a wound and kind of know where on the body it is. So our bodies are amazing and they give us the information we need to help. So we don't need anything else to start to help, which is great. Um, and the worst thing you can do is nothing, right? There is always something that you can do. And when you have a friend who is hurting, it is so hard to have them hurt. And the, what you want to do is you want to help. And that is what we are going to learn today. So that when someone is hurting, you can help. All right. So let's start out with something called a good Samaritan. And I want to know if you have ever heard of a good Samaritan. So in the chat box, <clears throat> excuse me, if you can type Y 
for yes, you have heard of a good Samaritan or N for no, you have not heard of a good Samaritan. So again, why for have you heard of a good Samaritan? Yes, or N for no, I have not heard of a good Samaritan. Zach has heard of a Good Samaritan. Great, Zach. I can't, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Donnie has not heard of a Good Samaritan. Well, we are going to help Donnie understand what a Good Samaritan is and why it's important. Mike says, yes, he has heard of a Good Samaritan. Well, great. Okay, so. Let's review for those who have heard of a Good Samaritan and let's go over it so that we can teach those who might have not heard or forgotten. So a Good Samaritan is someone, it's a story from the Bible. And in the Bible, there is someone who comes across a man who has been beaten and robbed. Okay, so now that we know a Good Samaritan is the man who helped the robbed and beaten man. Um, what do you think a good Samaritan law might mean? And I have some choices for you and I would like you to type in A, B, or C. So your choices are a good Samaritan law means that A, you will be paid for your help. B, you won't be sued or in trouble if something goes wrong while you're helping or C, you will be arrested if you rob a victim. So again, let's type A, B, or C for what a good Samaritan law means. A, you will be paid for your help. B, you won't be in trouble if something goes wrong when you're helping. Or C, you will be arrested if you rob the victim. So Zach says A, you will be paid for your help. Donnie says B, you won't be in trouble if something goes wrong. All right, so the correct answer is B. You won't be in trouble if something goes wrong. You are protected if you try and help someone that is in trouble. You cannot be sued, you cannot be arrested. If you act, you will be not be held accountable for um, if something does go wrong when you're helping them. Because we want to live in a world where people help each other, right? And you're not scared of getting in trouble. Okay, so again, it just protects anyone willing to help an injured person in an emergency, and you cannot be held account responsible or sued if you help in a real emergency or death situation. Okay, so now that we know that you can help without worrying. Let's talk about the different jobs in an emergency. Okay, so what do we call the people in each job? Let's start with the provider. The provider is the person who gives someone something they need. So let's think about your parents. Your parents provide you with food and shelter, they give you the things you need, the things that you might not be able to give yourself. And as a provider to someone who needs help, because they're hurt, they're gonna be limited. They're not gonna be able to help themselves a lot of times. So the provider is someone who gives someone something that they need. And guess who is the provider? You are the provider. You will be the one providing the help because someone is hurt. All right, so that someone who is hurt, they are the victim. So in, as we go through this class, when I say victim, that means the person who has been injured because of a crime or an accident. So you are the provider. So if I say provider, that means you. And if I say victim, that is the person who is hurt. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a scenario and I want you to tell me who in this story is the victim. 
Okay, so you see a dog bite your brother. Is the victim D, the dog, or B, your brother? So a scenario, thank you, Johnny. A scenario is a story. I'm gonna tell you a short story, a situation that could happen, right? And you're gonna give me some input on this scenario or story. So the story is that a dog bites your brother. Who is the victim? Is it D, the dog, D for dog, or B for brother? So I'm gonna give you a second in the chat box. Donnie says D, the dog is the victim. And um, we have Corrine says B, and Zach says B. Okay, as much as, um, as much as your brother might have angered the dog, your brother is in fact the victim. So your brother is the victim here because he's the one who got hurt and he's the one you're gonna wanna help. Okay, so as the provider, which is you, what are your goals? Where well, our goals are to keep that person alive, right? That's the first one, keep them alive. Second, you wanna help them to feel better. Um, you also don't want them to get hurt anymore. And you wanna start healing, right? So goals, let's keep them alive. Let's help them, let's give them some comfort, help them to feel better. Let's help them not get hurt further than they already are. And let's start them healing, okay? Oh, wait, sorry. Okay, now I have a picture on the screen. And what it is, is it is a box, okay? And it has a handle on the top. And there is a red cross or a red, it looks like a plus sign as well on it. Now, you may have seen these boxes out in the community or you may have picked one up or used one. Do you, I would like in the caption um, or in the chat box for you to write what you think this box is for. It has a name and I want us to learn what it is so that we will be able to ask for it or recognize it. Again, it is a, usually it's a white box. It usually has a handle on the top um, and it usually has a red plus sign or a red cross in the middle. Okay, so Donnie says, hospital and Zach says medicine and Mike says band-aid. Well, you know what? You are all correct. The name of this is a first aid kit. So a first aid kit. Um, you're right. It can have medicine in it. It can, it definitely is at a hospital. Um, and it definitely has some band-aids in it. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about this first aid kit and why it's so important. Okay, so at your house, you want to always have it in the same place because when you are in an emergency and things are happening fast, it's the last time to go looking for something you can't find, right? You wanna know exactly where it is so you can say, hey, I want to stay with this person. You go grab it. It is under the cabinet in the bathroom or wherever you may keep it, okay? Another thing that you want to do is you want to check your first aid kit every year because you might use things out of it to help others or some of it might get old and not be helpful anymore. So let's make sure we keep it in the same place every year. Um, in our homes, and let's make sure that we replace the stuff every year. That is not good. So now Mike said band-aids might be in this box and medicine, and those are all correct. And what else might you find in a first aid kit? If you have any ideas, please type them into the chat box of what else besides band-aids and medicine might you find in a first aid kit? Or might you want to have 
in a first aid kit if you were in an emergency. All right, Zach says scissors, but mom says they are always missing from the kit. I think I know why the scissors might always be missing because we need scissors to do schoolwork, right? And we always tend to borrow them from something that we know where it is, which is the first aid kit. So that is wonderful because that means that Zach's family knows where the first aid kit is. And that is wonderful. So scissors might be in the first aid kit. That's correct. Um, Donnie says gauze and Corinne says phone numbers for doctors. Oh, that is a wonderful idea, Corinne. I love that idea, actually. I had not thought of that. Thank you. Beautiful answers. And I agree. All of those things are great. Now, for people who might not know what gauze is, gauze is like um, kind of like a paper towel, but it's made of cotton and fabric. And it's something that you can use to absorb as well. So I love that idea. Um, Okay, so we talked, we did mention band-aids previously and I wanted to show you a band-aid. So a band-aid comes in lots of different sizes. Oops. Um, and you wanna make sure that the band-aid covers the alley, okay? So you want it to be big enough to cover up the cut. That will keep it clean and it will help stop the bleeding. Now, if you have a Band-Aid, you'll notice that on one side, the edges are separated. And that is so that when you feel that one side and they're separated, that's where you pull apart. So you pull apart the Band-Aid and inside is something that on one side feels kind of rubbery. And then on the other side feels very slick and smooth. Now the slick and smooth side is what is attached to an adhesive, which is kind of like something sticky with glue. So that is why these little papers you'll feel are over them. That's because if they weren't, they would just stick to the um, wrapper. And we wanna save that stickiness for your skin. So the sticky part is what goes on your skin. So you're gonna peel these little flaps of paper. There's two of them, one on each side. And that will expose the middle, which in the middle is kind of like a gauze. And that is what is, you're going to put on your cut because that will keep it clean and it will help stop the bleeding. And then when you pull it off, those sticky parts, you can feel them. They're nice and sticky. That's what's going to stick to your skin and keep it from falling off. So Band-Aids are wonderful and they should definitely be in your first aid kit and have lots and lots of sizes because we all know that we like lots of band-aids. Okay, and you can do any character, any color, you can make it fun too. Okay, now here I have something called a non-stick pad. This is what you use for burns. This is gonna feel similar to the center of the band-aid, but it's gonna be a little more slippery. Now this one, you just tear it open like this. You tear it open, and it reveals kind of like just a big middle Band-Aid, right? But the joy of these is unlike gauze, these don't have a lot of fibers. You know how if you feel a paper towel, it's really rough and um, it's got a lot of texture to it. These are very smooth because in burns, we don't want all those fibers to get stuck in the burns because the burn is gonna create a big scab. And what happens when you change it? You pull it off and the scab comes with it and it bleeds again. So non-stick pads are also wonderful for your first aid kit. Um, another thing, this is a tube. It's about, it's a little smaller than a cheese stick. It's a little wider than a cheese stick, but it's a tube of something called Neosporin. It's also called triple antibiotic ointment. And that's exactly what it does. It, an antibiotic, is something that kills bacteria bacteria on your skin. And the reason we want that is your skin is like, um, well, your skin is actually the biggest organ in your body. And it is a protector for all your organs and your muscles. And when your skin gets ripped, it potentially lets um, 
infection into your body. And so this is not only going to seal off your cut, but it's gonna kill all those yucky germs that we know come when we have, when we fall in the dirt, right? Because we know dirt is yucky. Okay, now another thing, gloves. Gloves um, will protect not only you from if there's something on your hand that could potentially um, get into your skin from the victim, but it also protect them from getting your germs. Okay, hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizer is everywhere now. It comes in so many colors and smells and it also kills germs. So if you can have hand sanitizer, which if you're like me, the hand sanitizer is everywhere in my car, in my house, and at, at school, it's everywhere. So that's also nice. You can get in a little bottle. Keep it in your first aid kit. And last, a mask. Now, <laughs> I know that these masks are not uncommon nowadays. So thankfully, they are everywhere. And a mask is going to, again, protect you, but also protect the person from getting, like, what if you have a cold? and you're leaning in to really help for someone. You wanna keep them as healthy as possible too. So first aid kits. Now I wanna ask you a question. Why for yes and for no? Um, yes, Donnie, you're right. You do need a mask for COVID. So we should have masks everywhere. And that is, that is one of the blessings of this hard time is we do have things more readily available like gloves and masks and um, antibiotic, or um, sorry, hand sanitizer. We're definitely more aware of it. So thank you, Donnie. You are right. All right. I want to know, do you think that people keep first aid kits in the car? Can you type Y for yes and N for no? Do you think people keep first aid kits in the car? Corinne says yes. Donnie says yes and no. I am gonna, oh, and Zach says yes, it is very small. <laughs> Zach, you are, everybody is right. Well, Donnie's right, because some people do keep them in the car and some people don't. Now, I'm gonna show you my first aid kit and Zach is correct, it is very small. It is actually about the size of my hand. Um, and it just keeps a couple of the most important things. But we are at the park often, right? We're trying to get outside now that it's warm and enjoy the fresh air and see people a little bit more. So we're not at home as much, which is where our first aid kit usually is. But that's why it's so important to also keep one nice and small, like Zach said, in the car so that when you're at the park and you fall, you will have the things that you need like band-aids. Okay, now where else do you think that you could find a first aid kit? If you can type in the comments, um, I would appreciate that. Okay, sorry. So Mike says that you could see first aid kits at the store. At their Easter sales, there might be some first aid kits. That's correct. Oh, oh sorry about that. Okay, now all of these are correct. I wanna show you some other places that, oh, at your school, yes, Corrine, and at your job. Yes, Mike says at your job. You know what, now that you know what it looks like, a first aid kit, you're gonna start seeing them everywhere because they are everywhere, which is great. Um, so let's talk about personal ones. Homework, your homework for today. I want you to see if you can find and identify where a first aid kit is in your house, and maybe in your car. And if you don't have one, your homework is to get one. So you can get them for like $5 on Amazon or at Walmart or CVS, or you can make your own. Get a sandwich bag and put a couple band-aids in it and a couple um, of the, like a tube of the antibiotic ointment. Um, yeah, keep it in the kitchen because right, we're we're gonna talk about that soon. In the kitchen, we are cooking, right? Which means we could get burned. We're chopping things, which means we could get a cut. That is a great idea. Okay, now in the community, 
or outside of your home, your orientation instructor will have a first aid kit, your school will, and your bus. So anywhere you need one, just ask. Someone should be able to find one. Okay, now we're going back to you. You are the provider. What actions? Now that we know what we need to care, what are we actually going to do? Okay, so we're going to alert and we're going to care. Now I have a picture of a lady and she is sitting in a yoga pose and she has her fingers together and she's very zen next to a sunset because when we do an assessment or when we just scan around and see what's going on, the most important thing is to stay calm because you are going to set the tone. If you are nice and calm, then everybody else will stay calm. So if you need, take a deep breath in your nose, breathe out your mouth, and then let's get to the assessment. So let's make sure first, let's check for danger because remember how we talked about them not getting hurt further? We don't want you to get hurt either because if you get hurt, then we have more victims now and no one to take care of them. So if there is glass, fire, or gas, try and get those away. But if there's things like live electrical wire, like a power line has gone down or something, you just need to stay back because you could potentially get electrocuted. So use all those wonderful senses you have and see if the place is safe if you can remove it, or if you should just stay away yourself. Okay, next airway. We're going to check if the person is breathing because right, if we're not breathing, pretty much nothing else matters. Okay, so if they are on their backs, you can put your cheek to their mouth and you can feel for warm breath. And while you're feeling for that warm breath, you can watch their chest rise and fall or you can just put your hand on their chest and you can feel it going up and down. Now, um, one thing you need to note is how are they breathing? Is their breathing really fast and short and shallow? Or is it slow and very deep? Like is, is their chest going down very low and very high or is it just going kind of short and shallow? Because that will help you to know um, when later when we call, what to tell the person. So just how are they breathing? Okay, now, if they're on their back, if their chin is touching their chest and it's kind of crumpled like that, their um, airway is bent, we just wanna make sure that their chin is pointing to the sky and that their neck is long and straight. So that is something called a head tilt chin lift. And all you have to do is just take your hand Put it on their forehead, kind of where their hair starts, and just push towards the ground. What that's going to do is it's going to open their airway. Um, and that's just going to make their chin point more to the sky and make their neck nice and long. So just something simple. Your hand on their forehead where their hair starts and just push it towards the ground. You can even do, if you do it on yourself, if you put your hand on your forehead and just push back a little bit, you'll notice your chin goes out more and your neck gets nice and long. It's easier to take a deep breath. Okay, last we have recovery. Um, if they're unconscious, they need to be on their side. So after we've kind of chin, lifted the chin, we're gonna just roll them to their side because here's the thing. Sometimes people in trauma will throw up. And we don't want that throw up to get to come up and then go back down into their lungs. Because then it's like if you're in a swimming pool and you are underwater, and you can't breathe, right? And we all know throw up is gross and it's really bad for the lungs. So we just want to make sure we get them rolled to their side. Okay. So we've got the danger making sure we check the scene before we enter. We're gonna do the um, check for breathing, make sure their airway is good, and we're gonna get them in the recovery position. Okay, now, if there is more than one of you, if you are not by yourself, then one of you stays with the person who is hurt, and then you 
can point to the other person and say, you go call 911 and come back and help me. That come back and help me is important because sometimes people, again, we're, we're stressed, we're not thinking straight, but you need all the help you can get. So say you go call 911 and then come back and help me. Now, I just said something important. What is the phone number that you call in an emergency? If you could type it in the chat box, I want to know the type, the phone number you call in an emergency. Zach says 911. You guys were listening. I'm so proud of you. That's exactly right, Donnie. 911. And we learned last time that we can also ask Siri to call 911. So that would be just as fast, if not faster. And if you are alone, then you can stay with the person and you can just say, hey Siri, call 911. And then you don't even have to move. So if you have two people, you point, you go call 911 and then come back and help me. Or if you're by yourself, hey Siri, call 911. All right, you guys are so smart. I love this. So what is 911? It is a number when someone needs help right away. Okay, because there's an injury or immediate danger. So I am gonna take you through some scenarios or stories like we talked about of times when you should or should not call 911. Um, so here's the one. I want you to type Y for yes or N for no. Oh, and just a quick reminder, I am a nurse and I have worked, um, I've worked with kids in a sedation unit, uh, Donnie wanted to know, uh, where I help them go to sleep for scans. But I also have four of my own kids and I'm trying to keep, my goals are to keep them alive <laughs> and um, to keep them healthy and happy. And I do a lot of first aid pretty much every day. So that is why I'm so excited for you to learn this because this is something that you will use your whole life. Okay. So why for yes and for no? So the first picture I have, it says somebody is unconscious, not responding. And not responding means that when you say, are you okay, are you okay? They don't answer. And when you tap them, are you okay, are you okay? They don't answer. Um, so should you call 911 if you find somebody who is unconscious and not responding? Why for yes and for no? All right, Corrine says yes, Donnie says yes. And Zach says he will find his mom. All good answers, yes. Get help, right? 911 can help and mom can help. So yes, definitely get help when someone is not responding. Okay, scenario number two, yes or no, Y or yes, or Y or N. If the television has stopped working, should you Call 911 if the television has stopped working. Donnie says no. Kareen says no. <laughs> Zach says no. Ask mom. Yes. All perfect answers. I do get asked a lot when the television is not working. And you are all correct. Nine, the television, while if it stops working, it's definitely a bummer, but it's not an emergency. So that is a time that we should not call 911. Okay, next I have a picture of someone's leg and it says a grazed knee. And a grazed knee means like something kind of went by your knee and scratched it a bit. So if you kind of have a scratch on your knee, is that a time to call 911? Why for yes and for no. Green says no. Donnie says, what if I get an electric shock? And Zach says no. Okay. So I'm going to agree that grazing your knee is not a time to call 911. It is not an emergency. Now, if you do get an electric shock, I would say that you should check with an adult and have them check because an electric shock can cause a burn. And a burn might be a time to call 911. 
also if you pass out. <laughs> but we will talk about that soon. That's a great question. Um, thank you, Donnie. Okay, next question. I have a little girl, a picture of a little girl. Now, if you get in an argument with your sister, should you call 911? Is that an emergency? Why for yes and for no? Argument with sister. Zach says no. Donnie says no. Green says no. Guys are so smart. You are correct. Arguing with your sister, it's not fun, but it's also not an emergency. 911 really can't help you with that. And Mike says no, it would be every day. That's right. 911, we want to reserve 911 for something that nobody else, that we can't fix ourselves, right? And you know what? As you get older, you might actually like your sister. It's possible. Okay. Next scenario or story. If the building is on fire, should you call 911? Is that an emergency? If the building is on fire, yes. Why for yes and for no. Why can't I? Okay, Donnie was wondering why 911 can't fix fights. Now, if the police need to be involved, then yes. Um, but if it is something that your mom can intervene in, let's go to mom first. I like Zach's answers. Ask mom first. Okay, Zach says, yes, we need to call 911 if the building is on fire, as does Mike, and you are both correct. Um, 911 contacts all, they have the numbers for every emergency personnel. So they can call the fire department. They can call the ambulance. They can call the police. That is why 911 is such a great resource because then you don't have to remember all those numbers. Okay, next one, next scenario. I have two kids, friend, a friend doesn't want to play with you. Is that a time to call 911? Is that an emergency? If a friend does not want to play with you. What's personnel? Okay, great question, Ani. Um, Donnie, um, personnel are people, a person. It's a people that work somewhere. So um, the police work at the police station. They're the people who work at the police station and the firefighters are the people who work at the fire station. So that, that is a good question. Personnel are the persons who work at these places. Okay, so no, we should not call 911 if our friends if we if friend won't play with us. It is it is heartbreaking, but we shouldn't call them. Okay, another one we should not call is a lost teddy bear. Losing something is not a reason to call 911. All right, my last one, I have someone who has their hands over their throat and it says somebody is choking. So, let's let's this will be our last question. Should we call 911 if someone is choking? Now, choking, if you don't know what choking is, choking means something has gotten stuck in your breathing tube. And so you can't breathe because something is in that straw that we have that is um, goes to our lungs. So if you have like a piece of food stuck in your throat and you can't breathe, should we call 911? Okay, oh, let's we'll get that. So, yes, Kareen, that is correct. We should call 911 if someone is choking. Okay, so we kind of talked about who would call, who would answer. Um, yeah, choking on water. Um, let's go to, let's see if we can get to choking. Um, okay, okay, we'll go there later. So, yes, we're going to talk about choking a little bit more in a minute. And if we don't get to it today, because we are going to end early, um, because that happens sometimes. We do need to end at 3.45. Um, we will revisit it another time. Okay, now here's one thing I want you to know when you call 911, okay? I want you to stay on the phone. Do not hang up until somebody arrives to help you. So unless some, until somebody comes to where you are, do not hang up the phone. They will need to know your address, where you are, and the more details you can give them, 
the better. So you can say, I am at the school on the second level. The school is across from the Dairy Queen and I'm on the second level in the cooking lab. You know, the more details you can give them, the better. Okay, also let them know that you have a hard time seeing because they're gonna start asking you lots of questions and that'll save time and they will know how to, um, what questions to ask you. Um, and also they, it will save time. You, they won't waste time asking questions that are too hard to answer. So um, let them know that you're visually impaired. Let them know your address and your location and let them know what's going on. What is the emergency? Somebody is choking. Somebody is um, not responding to you talking to them or they're cut. Let them know what's going on. That'll help them prepare. Also let them know who needs help. How many people are hurt? Is it one person? Are they a small person? Is it a big person? Is it, you know, is it um, an older person maybe who's had a stroke? So who needs help? Okay, we're gonna do another scenario real fast. We're meaning a story. So you are home alone. So we've established nobody else is there with you and you scrape your knee. Let's find out what we're gonna do. You are gonna find the cleanest cloth possible and apply pressure. Now, a cloth can be anything. It can be a washcloth. Like I just have an orange washcloth right here. Um, it can be paper towels. It can be anything like that. And you're gonna apply pressure. And um, one more piece of homework for you today is I want you to find out where the rags or the cloths or the bandages are located in your house. Because remember, sometimes the adults aren't around. You're home alone in this scenario. Or maybe in this scenario, the adult is actually the person who gets hurt and you're the only one there to help them. So homework today, identify where the rags or the cloths or bandages are in your home. Okay, so real fast. If you wanna know what pressure, when I say apply pressure, that means push down firmly on the owie or the wound. And what that does is your blood vessels are like straws and it will push them together because straws are bendy. Um, oh, you know what? I am not gonna, I'm not gonna make you turn this homework in. I just want you to do this for your benefit. And if I get back on here again to teach another class, I'll ask you then, okay? And I'll find out if you listen. So thank you, Donnie. Okay, so yeah, pressure. We're just going to close up those straws that are blood vessels and it'll stop the bleeding and help it to clot. Okay, we have two more minutes. Um, so bleeding, we need to apply that direct pressure. We need to make sure that the victim lays down because if they're losing a lot of blood, they're going to get dizzy and we don't want them to pass out and faint and fall and hit their head, right? Okay, now as long as their wound is not broken, you can lift it up. So if their arm is bleeding, elevate it, lift it up higher. That's gonna make the blood drain to the heart, which is where the blood needs to be pumped anyways, and it'll slow the, ble the bleeding down. Okay, also, if you bleed through the cloth, like if your um, rag gets full of blood, don't take it off the wound, just put another one on top of it, okay? This is gonna help the clotting to keep going. So just don't remove the band-aid, put it back on top. Okay, how are we gonna clean a wound? Well, if you can, wash your hands first, because again, we don't wanna get any germs to them and put on gloves. You need to rinse it in clean water and that'll get all the, it'll swoosh all the dirt out and then put a little soap and clean around the potential wound. We don't ever wanna put soap directly into the wound because it will burn, it'll really hurt. Um, and then we can put a little bit of the antibiotic cream on and apply a um, Band-Aid or a wound as needed. And we will talk about more next time. You guys did amazing, I'm so proud of you. And I hope that you can help someone when you find them in this situation. Thank you so much, Melissa. And
thank you all for attending our virtual Excel Academy today. We do have to end a little early because we had a conflict happening at APH, but we will be back again tomorrow and we will definitely see Miss Melissa again. Thank you, Melissa. You did wonderful. Bye all.